Hey everybody, we are the Good Doctors of Abbey Research, as ever, Dr. Aaron. Dr. Kristen. And we're here with something new and different. Yes, we are on Zoom. Yes, this video is on YouTube, but we are not talking about television. We are talking about a podcast. A <gasps> podcast. A podcast, folks. Um, for those of you that know us already, you know we spend a lot of time talking about women's rights and equality and all sorts of things that go along with that. Uh, and coming up this month, in the month of August 2020, we're going to have the centenary anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, even though it only really gave it to white women. Um, technically, the amendment gave it to all women, but then our ingenious little politicians found lots of ways to disenfranchise women of color, black women, indigenous women, etc. Uh, which is always the asterisk that we put on suffrage. But because of this centenary, we have a fabulous new podcast from our friends, Rosario Dawson and Retta, called And Nothing Less. And that is what we are going to be talking about for the next seven weeks. We have seven episodes where we're going to learn a hell of a lot about suffrage, and we're very excited about it. So up first, episode one, The Cult of True Womanhood. Um, we're not really going to deep dive into the content of this because a lot of it was stuff we already knew. Uh, Dr. Kristen had um, literally just finished Elaine Weiss's book, The Women's Hour, um, and we have our Abbey Research Reads review of it. Um, but I'm going to put on my historian hat for a few minutes and then Dr. Kristen's going to talk a little bit about the structure of the podcast. And then hopefully once we get into later episodes, we will have a lot more to dig into because one of the things we are both learning is that we don't learn the, the, uh, the full history of suffrage. Um, so before you get started, let's yeah. start the way the podcast did. What, before you started looking at this and before like we became friends and I started railing about women's rights, what did you think the 19th Amendment was? Definitely that women got the right to vote. And did you think it was like a really big fight or a big deal or like, do you, do you remember if you had any thoughts about that? I really, I honestly don't remember learning that much about suffrage um, and spending a lot of time on the suffrage movement uh, at all in my schooling. So I don't remember learning um, about the protests. I don't remember learning about uh, the incarceration of women and the hunger strikes. Like, I vaguely recall getting bits and pieces thrown in, um, but I can't reasonably point to like a significant portion of my U.S. history that talked about it. Um, and so I've, I feel like I've been making a potted history of it ever since I graduated high school, you know, like put bits and pieces together. Um, but I grew up out West in Colorado. So I don't know if your experience being closer to uh, Seneca Falls and closer to, you know, where Alice Paul was uh, lived and based that, that you had more access to it. Um, we didn't, we talked a lot about cowboys and Indians stereotypically where I was raised, so. Yeah, I got the sanitized version of it for sure. Um, I was not told anything about Alice Paul because she is not the, um, I think, socially acceptable suffragette that Susan B. Anthony was. Mm, yeah. um, I remember definitely thinking that Susan B. Anthony is the only reason we had suffrage. Correct. Um, yeah. And I, I remember definitely thinking that she was like alive when it passed. Like to find out that she had died well before that was amazing. To me, I had no idea that it was part of abolition or anything. And the first time I know I heard about the hunger strikes was in grad school when I watched Iron Jawed Angels, which is an HBO movie starring Hillary Swank. <laughs> and it um it graphically depicts the women being force fed um and the women chaining themselves to the white house fence um and i remember sitting in my living room in in waco texas and like my jaw dropped like why wasn't i taught any of this the, yeah. this is my legacy i was raised in a family where voting was very important um mm -hmm. and was i it was understood that the literal second i turned 18 i would register to vote yeah same. um and so enfranchisement, and I remember like my grandmother who was born, my mother's mother, who was born in 1919, um, talking about 
how important it was. And it was to her almost like a holy privilege. And I remember my aunt, every time my grandmother said that, my aunt would be like, no, 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 no. It's our constitutional right, mother. Like, it's not, like, she would correct her immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but beyond that, I didn't really investigate it until, um, until I actually had to teach British suffrage when we were in Belfast. Yes. Um, And I had to... I had to explain who Emily Davison was. I needed to learn the difference between suffragettes and suffragists. I had to understand the differences between the British suffrage movement, which is not tied to abolition nearly as strongly, um, and also is a much messier process in some ways than American suffrage was. Um, And I then realized I knew nothing about American suffrage in the same way that like when you learn Spanish, you realize that you were never taught English grammar. Yeah. And so you like retroactively start learning it. Um, and then it became a bit of a, like, I'm going to learn everything I can. Um, yeah, no. And I learned, I learned a lot from you learning a lot from having to teach British suffrage, which is a fascinating, uh, which happens a lot. You know, I think a lot of times when we, when we go outside our own cultural context and we have to look back into where we came from, we realize all the things we didn't know. Um, and you and I have spent a lot of the last four years um, since we left Belfast kind of rectifying some gaps in our uh, American history knowledge. But I think that's the the vitality of this podcast at this time. And that's the opportunity that centenaries provide, right? And we lived through a lot of centenaries in in our time in Ireland. Um, But commemoration provides us an opportunity to reevaluate and to to look at where we've come and and how we tell that story of those historic events and why we tell it the way we tell it because history is very politicized who writes his you know who lives who dies who tells your story Hamilton reference um and I'll say too what's interesting what's particularly interesting about suffrage is that the British the British suffrage movement is delayed compared to the American one but the idea of womanhood and femininity and like they use the phrase the cult of true womanhood in this in the podcast a lot and they use it during suffrage a lot of that was actually spanned the oceans it was very common the definition of womanhood was closer in the 18 in regency all the way up through the end of victoria's reign in both sides of the atlantic than it's ever been before or since yeah um and we draw a lot of what it meant to be a proper this is when you have a lot of American heiresses going to England to get titles. Yes. And very poor titled men from England coming over to marry heiresses. Um, and that doesn't just happen in romance novels, guys. That was a thing. Happened to um, And so th- that connection is also something that um, I am fascinated by. Yeah. That this definition of middle class womanhood and propriety, which is also something we saw in Mrs. America that we just watched all together. Yes. Um, and the elasticity of the understanding of, of, of womanhood um, and the power of domesticity, mm-hmm. um, I think is something that I took for granted, even as like I read Elaine's, uh, Elaine Weiss's book, which is absolutely fabulous. I kept circling things that I was like, oh my God, it really is that pernicious. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, it really, oh, oh. Oh, okay. Because the number one thing I think neither one of us was taught was that there were women who were against it. Oh yeah. And uh, and the the sec the number two thing we were not taught uh, about it was the lack of intersectionality, which we also Completely. talked about in Mrs. America, um, and the the lack of intersectionality in second wave feminism. Uh, which comes because there was a lack of intersectionality in uh, first wave feminism. And I think, you know, to have two black women hosting this podcast is obviously very intentional. Um, It's done with support from the National Park Service and the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. And so it's, it's very clear from the conversations I've seen about suffrage this year um, that the women who are in charge of these organizations are trying to rectify that error. Um, I know League of Women Voters has as well been working hard to do that. Yep. So um, I think for me, that's, that's the biggest thing. And it's so interesting because I was even talking to to my mother about this. Um, 
in what I understood the 19th amendment to be versus the voting rights act. And like, yes. why did we need the voting rights act if we had the 15th and the 19th amendments, which guaranteed black men and women the right to vote. Franchisement. Yeah. Franchisement. Um, and it, the, I didn't even make that connection that like the reason we needed the voting rights act was because we had systematically disenfranchised black and brown folks even after we gave them constitutional rights and in these amendments um and so and a lot of that has to do with the way history is told and the narrative that we have about our country as a nation um and the rights that we you know imbued in in the founding that have not ever actually been fully realized um and a phrase i keep hearing uh all throughout this year, but especially in conversations about suffrage in the last couple of weeks is, you know, none of us are free until all of us are free, but we live under the myth that all of us are free um, because, you know, land of the, uh, land of the brave, home of the free, whatever it is. Um, uh, and so I think that's the important thing we can take from this episode is all of the intersections that we don't know and all of the historical context of um, abolition, all the different movements of, of women who weren't invest, who did not want suffrage, mm -hmm. um, and the connection to temperance movements around that time period, which was happening internationally. So this um, is a real time of social reform though, totally, right? Yeah. Like internationally from like 1820 to 1930-ish, right? Yeah. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, and also the influence of the Industrial Revolution on that, right? Okay. So okay. you see, uh, and just, you know, from my knowledge of, of, of global history, you see massive social movements because of the impact of, of globalized industry. Um, you see greater pushes for, for abolition of, of slavery, um, the rise of, of nationalism in Europe and everywhere else, the changing borders, the, the, the ending of monarchies and um, empires. All of this is happening with these increased social movements for reform, for labor, for health. Because once you get the Industrial Revolution, then you start to talk about child labor um, and workers' rights. And so all of this is happening. At, you know, nothing happens in a vacuum. And so um, even just that they touch on those movements in this podcast episode is such a great reminder that we have to view everything within its larger context, be they local context, national context, or international context. It's just such a spider web. Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, I was just thinking about, like, I remember there was an, a movie in the aughts called The Butterfly Effect with Ashton Kutcher. Yes. And um, it's not good, like, let's be real clear. <laughs> um, but I definitely watched it. And the whole thing was like, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Chechnya, it affects, you know, Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember thinking, like, people talked about that as completely bogus and like yeah. really out there. And I just remember sitting there thinking like, but it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and especially, you know, as the world became more globalized and you had the readily, uh, like the increasing availability of information um, so, you know, communication and, and all of that transportation that then moves all of these ideas around the world. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, they talk about the influence of print media, uh, mm -hmm. on the suffrage movement. And so, yeah, all of that becomes a bit of a butterfly effect. And so, um, yeah, I I'm fascinated to see where they go next. Yeah. Uh, and I'm excited to get to have this conversation, even though it's happening really for the first time when we're 37, but better late than never. Yeah, we're just going to embrace the fact that we came to the party at all. Um, <laughs> and I am going to close this out with, with two movie recommendations if you are missing our movie coverage. Um, that movie I recommended, Iron Jawed Angels, is still on HBO Go. It is a very... Um, it really it follows the um kind of the two arms of the movement and the the fight over violence versus pacifism and then there's a movie that is sorry is carrie mulligan called suffragettes which is um quite good focuses entirely on the british movement uh -huh. features a 
to my mind, ill-advised cameo of, <laughs> of uh, Meryl Streep. I know. It takes you completely out of the movie. Um, but it covers a lot over there. There's also, um, we will try to find a link to this because I think it's on YouTube, um, a fascinating um, analysis of um, a suffragette named Emily Davison and one of the impetuses of the British suffrage movement. And as much as this podcast, and then we will try to talk about American suffrage, you really can't connect, disconnect the two in a lot yeah. of ways. Um, and so we'll be moving back and forth. The Pankhursts were incredibly influential to Susan B. Anthony, and they, re they work together a lot. Um, and that's not the case for the enfranchisement movement in Australia and New Zealand, for instance. Mm. They, were much, they were much more separate and independent. Ours moved back and forth because our citizens moved back and forth so much. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we will, be, we will be addressing that a little bit more and also just because we're nerds, biased <laughs> nerds, and we know a lot about <laughs> British suffrage. So. Um, on, trying to stay on brand. Um, but yeah, I love that it's a conversation between them. Uh-huh. Um, I love that they started off by telling us that they uh, are also, also didn't know what was going on. Um, and I love both Rosario Dawson, um, who I is, is an underrated actress as far as I'm concerned constantly. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know Retta, you, you probably know her as Donna Meagle from Parks and Recreation. She yeah. is the uh, character that created Treat Yourself. Um, <laughs> her and, and Aziz Ansari's character, Tom Haverford. So you probably know visually who Retta is, you've seen her in memes. Um, but she's also on a show called Good Girls with Christina Hendricks and Mae Whitman that is very good on NBC right now and is an absolutely hysterical comedian in her own right. She um, is. So, so these two women are, are able entertainers to guide us through uh, this journey and I'm excited. Me too. That is all we've got for episode one. We'll see you guys next week for episode two. Uh, and we're excited to learn and uh, talk about this. So please comment and, and share your thoughts. And if you have, you know, books or, or what any sort of recommendation uh, on suffrage or any intersecting um, topics, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. See you guys next week. Bye.